Hi, this is Tawny with the Kinsman Free Public Library, and to celebrate both National Library Week and Earth Week, we are going to share stories today about flowers, turning something sad into something beautiful, and a bunny who likes books. Also, be sure to check out and watch for a bunch of different videos about super fun Earth Day activities you can do while still practicing social distancing. All right, here we go. Our first story is Flowers Are Calling by Rita Gray. Flowers are calling. Flowers are calling a little black bear. No, not a bear. He doesn't care. They're calling a butterfly to dip from the air. Flowers are calling a wet green frog. No, not a frog. She likes her soggy bog. They're calling a bumblebee to look near their log. Flowers are calling a porcupine. No, not a porcupine. She wouldn't take the time. They're calling a hummingbird to sip at their vine. Queen Anne's Lace. Butterflies like a landing pad where they drink nectar. Monk's Hood. Bumblebees are hefty enough to push deep inside a monk's hood flower where the nectar is stored. Trumpet Honeysuckle. Hummingbirds use their long tongues to reach the nectar hidden in deep tubular flowers and hover as they drink. Flowers are calling a loud blue jay. No, not a jay. He wouldn't stay. They're calling a honeybee to fly their way. Flowers are calling a little moose. No, not a moose. What would be the use? They're calling a beetle to eat their pollen loose. Flowers are calling a rabbit to stop. No, not a rabbit. It's not their habit to call a rabbit. He might grab it. They're calling a bee to fly to visit their spot. Apple tree blossoms. Honeybees help make many of the fruits, nuts, and vegetables we eat by pollinating fruit tree blossoms, such as the apple tree. There are also thousands of varieties of wild bees that help to make many of the foods we eat. Magnolia. Beetles have been visiting flowers for more than a hundred million years. Violet. Bee flies look like bumblebees but have two wings instead of four. Like hummingbirds, they are able to hover their furry bodies in the air as they drink nectar. Flowers are calling a small brown snake. No, not a snake for goodness sake. They're calling a pollen wasp with nectar to take. Flowers are calling a fat raccoon. No, not a raccoon. He doesn't care for white, blossom, white bloom or sweet perfume. They're calling a moth in the light of the moon. Flowers are calling a desert deer. No, not a deer. He can't even get near. They are calling a nectar bat to flap over here. Blow out beard tongue. Pollen wasps, like bees, make loaves of nectar and pollen to feed their young. Cardin cactus. Lesser long-nosed bats have long tongues that can reach the nectar deep inside the bell-shaped flowers of the cardin cactus. These cactus flowers unfurl for just one short night. Moonflower and Carolina sphinx moths. Sphinx moths are expert flyers with very long tengus, with tongues. Like cardin cactus, the blooms of moonflowers open for just one night and depend on the nighttime visits of moths for pollination. Flowers are calling a busy wren. No, not a wren. He's already seen them. They're calling some children to look again. Look at the flowers. What do you see? Color. Flowers that have daytime visitors tend to have bright colors so they can be easily found among all the green foliage. Flowers with nighttime visitors tend to be pale with a very sweet smell, making them easier to locate in the dark. Many insects can't see the color red and instead are drawn to yellows and blues. Pattern. Many flowers use designs to help the pollinator find nectar right away. These designs are called nectar guides. How is the middle of your flower different from the outer part? Would these differences help a pollinator find nectar? Shape. The shape of a flower can tell you who might come to visit. Hummingbirds can reach deep inside long, thin flowers, but honeybees have rather short tongues. 
They need the nectar served in shallow golden bowls, like those of the apple blossom. Bumblebees are rather heavy and need strong flowers that can hold their heft. Is your flower a tight cluster of many small blossoms, such as Queen Anne's lace or dandelion? Then it will be good for all those insects, like a sturdy perch. Smell. Does your flower smell sweet or musky? Does it have a smell at all? Bees like sweet smells and beetles like fruity, spicy scents. Night active moths love flowers as fragrant as perfume. Nectar bats love musky smells and some flies like rotten smells. Birds and butterflies use their eyes to find flowers instead of their sense of smell. Time of opening. Does your flower open in the daytime or the nighttime? If it is a night bloomer, then it is, it is calling to a night moth or a nectar bat. Day bloomers are calling to birds and insects who find food in the sunshine. Would you believe flowers need pollinators to flourish and pollinators need flowers for nourishment? A pollinator is any animal or insect that helps a flower to trade pollen with another flower like itself. Most flowers need to trade pollen with each other so they can make seeds. These seeds will grow into new plants. Here are some fascinating ways flowers call to their special pollinators. Many insects and birds see an ultraviolet light. This allows them to see nectar guides that are invisible to us. A flower that appeals, appears to us as one solid color can actually have a prominent two-toned bullseye at its center. This sends a loud, clear message, drink here. Some early spring flowers create their own heat to give visiting insects a toasty room for the night. This ability to generate heat is called thermogenesis. This warmth also helps spread a flower's scent. Some flowers of coffee, orange, and grapefruit plants offer bees a, short, a shot of caffeine with their nectar. The bees like the caffeine and return to the blossoms for refills. The caffeine helps the bees to remember where they found it. Hmm, I think me and the bees have something in common. Flowers make their own electrical buzz that bees understand. This buzz can tell a bee how much nectar a flower has. In this way, flowers signal to bees of which flowers offer a full slurp of nectar. Bees, birds, butterflies, moths, bats, and other pollinators are some of the most important creatures on earth. When they drink the nectar of flowers and or eat flower pollen, they help plants to make new flowers. Some of these flowers become the fruits, nuts, and vegetables we eat every day. But pollinators are in trouble and we need and we can help. Perfectly manicured lawns that use toxic herbicides and pesticides offer nothing to pollinators. What they need instead are long grasses with an assortment of native species flowers. Ideally, the flowers will be lots of different colors and shapes and bloom throughout the growing season. Even a few flower pots or a window box can make a difference. And don't forget to include a fresh water source for your precious pollinators. The end. Our next story is The Branch by Mireille Messier. Ooh, I butchered that. The Branch. It's past my bedtime and I can't sleep. Maybe it's because I'm too excited about the holidays. Maybe it's because of the sound of the icy rain hitting my window. Tick, 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 tick. When I finally doze off, I dream that I am wearing a crown of icicles. My tree is my castle. My branch is my throne. I am queen of the storm. Creak, crack, crash, thud. My eyes snap open. What's that noise? I throw back my covers and rush to the window. Everything outside is covered in ice. It looks like the entire neighborhood has been wrapped in a heavy blanket of diamonds. It's beautiful, but a little scary, too. Mom stands next to me at the window. Her breath makes a cloud on the grass. We're lucky the whole thing didn't come down, she says. What came down, I ask? That's when I see it. At the foot of my tree lies a big, broken branch. I rush down the stairs and out the door. That was the branch I sat on, jumped from, played under. It was my castle, my spy base, my ship. I try to pick up my branch, but it's too heavy. 
I run my fingers along the bumpy ice. Can we fix it? I'm afraid not, says Mom. Can I keep it? It's just a branch. It's not just a branch to me. I played on this branch all the time. Mom touches the splintery part where on the trunk where the branch used to be. All right, you can keep it for a little while, but I want to keep it forever. We'll see, says Mom, squeezing my hand. I know that squeeze. It means probably not. As I look around, I see more broken branches in the yards, in the street, stuck upside down in the trees. I watch my neighbors digging and scraping. They gather broken branches and carry them to the curb, making a big heap like beaver dams in the city. Workers in shiny coats are clearing the road. They climb ladders, fix wires, wrap yellow tape around trees, and put orange cones on the sidewalk. Everybody is so busy. I wish I could climb my tree to watch them, but I can't. My next door neighbor, Mr. Frank, is out with his chainsaw. The buzzing makes my ears ache, but I won't go back inside. I block my ears and guard my branch. I want to make sure nobody comes to take it away or chop it up. Finally, Mr. Frank stops sawing when he catches sight of me over the fence. Why the long face? My favorite branch broke. Oh, I see. So what are you going to do with it? I shrug. It's just a branch. Just a branch? But it was your favorite, right? I nod. That's what I thought. That branch is full of potential. What's potential? It means it's worth keeping. Mr. Frank hands me a small piece of wood. What do you see? A piece of wood, sure. But what could it become? Mom comes over carrying mugs of hot chocolate. Hey, Frank. I see part of your tree came down, too. Yep, that was quite a storm we had. We're guessing what's hiding inside the wood, I tell Mom. Mr. Frank chuckles at Mom's puzzled look. I build things from salvaged wood, said says Mr. Frank. With some imagination, each broken piece can become something great. I look at my favorite branch. It has potential. I concentrate. I squint. And then I have an idea. I know what my branch can become. I knew you would, says Mr. Frank. What is it? Asks Mom. Is it a walking stick? A coat rack? A birdhouse? No, it's even better, I say. I cut my hand and whisper into Mr. Frank's ear. Whoa. Good idea, but I don't know how to make it. I can help, says Mr. Frank. I have the tools and I have the time. All you need is elbow grease. Mr. Frank's workshop smells sweet like Sunday breakfast. We work together on weekends and sometimes after school. He shows me how to use the tools to make my branch into something new. We draw plans, we measure, we saw. We saw some more. We dry the wood, and then we wait, and wait, and wait. We plane, we make holes, we sand, then we varnish three coats to make it last a long time. It wasn't just the branch, it was my branch. The one I sat on, jumped from, played under. It was my castle, my spy base, my ship. It still is. The end. And then our final story is Bunny's Book Club by Annie Silvestro. Bunny loved books. He loved them ever since he first heard the lady with the red glasses reading aloud outside the library. As he listened, Bunny imagined himself climbing mountains, captaining a ship, ruling a kingdom. But when summer ended, Story time moved back inside. Bunny wasn't sure if animals were allowed in the library, but Bunny was sure he couldn't live without books. Night after night, he could hardly sleep for wishing he had to do something. So, with a flashlight in his paws and hope in his heart, Bunny jumped out of bed and tiptoed through the dark. But when he reached the library door, it was locked. So were the windows. Bunny tried digging, climbing, and yanking. Nothing worked until finally he noticed the book return. The shiny handle was far above his head, but it was no match for a high hopping bunny hungry for books. 
Bunny leapt. He clung to the bar and flung himself over and wiggled his cottontail through the slot. He landed inside with a thud. Bunny's eyes sparkled at the sight of the shelves bursting with books. It was better than a field full of fresh, crunchy carrots. Bunny didn't know where to start. He took a breath, deep breath. It smelled as if he were wrapped inside the pages of his favorite book. Then, there, he found... He followed his nose to the adventure section. There, he found stories about swashbucklers, sharks, and superheroes. Bunny greedily grabbed them all. His whiskers twitched with excitement. He slipped his treasures through the book slot one by one. Then, he performed his best balancing act. Bunny wobbled home. He couldn't wait to dig in. And so, Bunny returned to the, to the library each night. He searched and sneaked, then scurried to read. Soon, his home was more books than burrow. Then, one evening, a loud knock startled Bunny. He closed his book and opened the door. Where have you been? asked Porcupine. Where are you doing? Why? said Porcupine. Bunny's eyes popped wide open. Why? he sputtered. Have you ever been to the library? It was time for Bunny to let Porcupine in on his secret. Are you sure this is a good idea? said Porcupine. Calm your quills, said Bunny. I'm too prickly. I'll never fit. Bunny pushed and shoved until pop went Porcupine. Bunny slipped in and flipped on his flashlight. Whoa, said Porcupine. I know, said Bunny. Do you think there's a story about balloons? I've always wondered about balloons. Most definitely, said Bunny. Sure enough, Porky Pine found books on balloons, and on deserts and dunes, and on caterpillars and cocoons. When Bunny handed him one about hedgehogs, he hugged it. The two friends took turns cramming books out the slot. Their towers teetered so high they could barely carry them. Back at Bunny's, they cozied up with cups of tea and carrot muffins. Together, they read until sunrise. One night, Bear noticed the light on at Bunny's. He opened the door and tripped over a stack of books. What's going on? said Bear. Here, said Bunny, handing him a book. Bear made room and settled in. Soon, more curious animals began visiting. Do you have any books about outer space? said Bird. Or about volcanoes? asked Mole. I'd like a ghost story, said Mouse. I think it's time for a field trip, said Bunny. One by one, the animals stuffed themselves into the library. Bear caused a bit of delay. They scattered about, sniffing the stacks, pawing over pages. Squirrels gathered stories about the circus. Raccoon nabbed one about outlaws and bandits. Frog found a fairy tale. No one heard the key in the front door. No one heard the clack, clack, clacking of footsteps. No one heard the light flick on. What do we have here? said the librarian. The animals looked up in shock. Bunny gasped. Porcupine gaped. Bear groaned. Follow me, she said. The animals marched slowly behind her. We're done for, whispered Porcupine. All libraries have rules, said the librarian sternly. Bunny's whiskers trembled. Porcupine's back bristled. Bear eyed the door. Bunny stepped forward to take the blame. The librarian leaned down. The first rule is, every book lover must have one of these, she said. She handed Bunny and his friends shiny new library cards. Now you may borrow books, she said, smiling. As long as you return them, of course. Bunny couldn't believe his ears. They could keep coming to the library. He beamed at his fellow readers and bounced to the shelves. He picked the perfect book and proudly checked out the very first official selection for... Bunny's Book Club. The end.